to the 23rd episode of Femgineer TV brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. In this show, I invite innovators in tech, and together we debunk myths and misconceptions related to building products and companies. If you're in a startup or any size organization, it's really tempting to want to experiment a lot. And because you're keen on experimenting, you might be saying yes to a number of things. Well, in today's episode, we're going to flip things around and actually teach you the value of learning to say no. And to help us out, I've invited Steli Efti, who is CEO and co-founder of Close.io. Thanks for joining us, Steli. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So you and I met back in April. Even though we live in Palo Alto, we met all the way out in Slovenia, which is pretty cool. And I know you've been uh, a founder at Close, and I want to get into all of that. But before we do, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about what got you into entrepreneurship and what led you down the road to starting a tech company. Yeah. So, well, lack of options yeah. is uh, w- one of the core reasons why I became an entrepreneur. I, I grew up um, in an immigrant family back in Germany. I'm originally from Greece, but I grew up in Germany. Um, everybody in my family worked at a factory. Nobody ever received a high education, and I was determined to keep that traditional life. I hated school. And um, I have two older brothers, and one day, uh, one of my brothers and I had an argument about success. And his point was that to make a lot of money, you either become academically successful and become a doctor or a lawyer, or you become a criminal kingpin, right? And he was a harmless 20-year-old guy watching yeah. too many what are gangster movies and listening to too many rap songs. Um, so he turned out fine, right? Sure. But, but his point was like to make a lot of money, these are the two ways that I think are available to us. And I hated both of these options, so I was arguing back and forth um, until he eventually said, all right, smart ass. What is your plan for success? What are you going to do? I opened my mouth and no words came out. And I think it was that moment where I realized I was 16 years old at that time. And that was the time I realized or the moment I realized how clueless I was. Because up, up until that point, for whatever reason, I had this belief that I was going to do great things in life without knowing what that meant. Yeah. And that moment made me realize that. So that kind of spiraled a lot of things into action and... Um, Eventually made me buy the first book that I've ever bought. Which was? Uh, it was a, a $9.99 book, Everything You Need to Know About Stocks. Okay. Because the only thing That's I knew... That's one way to get rich. <laughs> well, I, wa- I had watched a lot of movies, yeah. right? I didn't, Wall Street, I didn't read book. Gordon Street, Gecko. Gordon Gecko. I didn't know what stocks are. I'm like, I don't know what this thing is, but it seems like people made money with it. I saw it in a movie. Sure. So I went and bought a book about it, right? And it, I had, you know, didn't have a lot of money. So I bought a very cheap book about it, which was a godsend because I read it and it was written for somebody who has $9.99 to spare about the topic, right? It was very simple, yeah. big images, and I understood it. And it made me go, holy shit, this is, this is what stocks are? Like, I remember giving my mom a four-hour speech in the kitchen as she was cooking about, like, you don't understand the importance of this. We need to invest in stocks. This is crazy. So uh, that made me go back and buy another book okay. and then buy another book. And then eventually I bought a book about how to start a business and entrepreneurship. And then I realized, wait a second, there's this thing called entrepreneurship. I can start a business. I don't need a certificate Nobody need, or a doctorate. I don't need anybody's permission to do this. And I can be my boss. Nobody needs to promote me or like me. This is it. This is going to be my, my thing. Um, and that's it. You know, there, I was 16, 17 around the time where I realized that. And after a year or two of reading lots and lots of books, I was like, I'm well qualified to start my first business. Nice. And that's what I did. I, I dropped out of school and I started my first um, tiny little business. And as often you get successful the first time around or lucky, yeah. right? So I was lucky with that. And that kind of encouraged me to keep going. Um, I did a few small businesses back in Europe, nothing to do with technology, nothing to okay. do with software, uh, but did really well financially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, then 10 years ago, I had this idea for a technology company and software business. And since I had no background, I knew nobody who did. Um, I was like, you know what? The legend of Silicon Valley is pretty sexy and appealing. Let me sell everything I have. I'll buy a one-way ticket, and I'll go over to Silicon Valley, and I'll change the world. It didn't quite work out sure. like uh, how I imagined it originally, but that was kind of how I got here and why I started with entrepreneurship. 
So you didn't have a background in tech. And I think when you first started, let's just say you had a startup. It was less than successful. Let's just say it failed. It failed. Yeah. Uh, And then then you had the idea behind starting another startup. Mm -hmm. And that was a service-oriented business. Mm -hmm. It was Elastic 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 Sales. sales, Yeah, Yeah, Elastic Sales. So walk me through what Elastic Sales was and how did that get you interested in Close.io? Yeah, so Elastic Sales was... Really, the answer to the question, um, what will, how can we help more companies succeed and grow faster? And what is kind of, what are the, the, the bottlenecks or the things that make growth really, really difficult? And uh, to us, it was obvious that building a sales organization, figuring out a sales model, once you have a product or a technology, and let's say you have early signs that there might be a market for it, mm-hmm. to learn how to sell that product successfully and to, then to scale a sales organization around it. Um, it's very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're good at it, you might you know, crush your competition, although they have, you have a, a superior product. We all know businesses that had a better product and a better service and still lost because their competition was more aggressive, more successful in selling. So we thought, what if uh, no great business on this planet would ever fail because of a lack of sales? And how could we enable um, sales growth and acceleration? So we started with this, we, we had this idea that started very theoretical, and then we thought, you know what, let's not overthink this. Let's not do market research. Let's not come up with a name. Let's not put a website together. Let's not put together a slide deck. We had this idea on a Tuesday morning and we said, you know what, let's just um, uh, get a bunch of uh, uh, company names and phone numbers in a system um, and then let's start cold calling them and let them educate us if there's a market here. What are the objections? What is the price sensitivity? Mm-hmm. Can we convince anyone to outsource their sales yeah. to us? That was the whole idea. And within two weeks of doing that, we had more companies uh, than we had salespeople in our our outsourcing service. So we just got started, you know, helping startups accelerate their sales or scale their sales efforts by building sales teams for them. Um, And from day one, because two of my co-founders were technical. Yeah. And because I hated all the sales software that was out there with a passion, you t- took the, take those two things together and we were like, let's just build software that will allow our salespeople to do better than their competition and that will allow us to scale the services company. So that was the whole intent of how kind of close I was birthed. We never yeah. thought the services business sucks. Let's build a product company. Yeah. Um, we never intended to, to release the software. We just started building it and we didn't really know. We didn't have a vision. We just said everything else sucks. Let's build something great. Yeah. Right? That was it. But then because we're iterating uh, very closely and because we were in this unique spot of running like hundreds of sales campaigns for all these different companies and all these different markets, we built pretty unique software and we started having a real strong point of view of what we thought was good sales software. And eventually more and more people were telling us they want to buy the software and not just the services. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we finally released it and it grew very fast. And today that's all we do. So like you said, you've had a chance to look at hundreds of companies probably even a lot of failed companies. Have you, aside from sales, noticed maybe one thing that everybody does that leads to the failure? No, I've not noticed no? anything. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, yes. And, and the, the, the thing that I've noticed is that um, startups in particular, I mean, I think humans in general, but startups in particular, um, they lack focus yeah. and they are very bad at saying no to things. Okay. So how do we get focused? Do we like meditate, get eight hours of sleep, drink green tea? What do, what do we need to do? To we get do focused? all these things. Yeah. I think all these things are helpful. But I think something, something very simple and tactical is to learn to say no. To say no to uh, opportunities, to ideas, to things that interrupt you, to all kinds of things that we can get into detail yeah. on that. But learning to say no and practicing the discipline of saying no right. uh, is the simplest and fastest way that I know to gain focus. But saying no is really hard. Yes. That's why we don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Um, but it's not it's not uh, physically hard. It's not like, uh, you know... It, it, well, it's some, just... for some people it is. Like, they kind of internalize... The, the the emotional stress yeah, they have. Yeah. Yes. So it might it might manifest itself in some physical discomfort. Right. Uh, uh, most of the times it, it will. Yeah. But it starts on an emotional level okay. uh, and on a on a, a mental level. So the reason why we have difficulty to say no, it, it, I think there's two sides to to that mm-hmm. coin. One of it is that we have fear of missing out. Right. 
because we know that we can't be certain if the decision to reject something is going to be a good decision or not, right? We, we never know when an opportunity pops up, when some, a, a person comes into our life, when something is proposed to us, saying no to this, could this be a really bad idea, Yeah. right? Will I miss out on something great? Will I make a terrible mistake? How do I know that saying no is absolutely the right decision? And we never really know. It's impossible to know for certain. Um, so I think that fear of missing out, that that um, self-doubt that we have in our own opinion, in our own decision, and the imperfection of data and information that we right. have to make these decisions in a snapshot lend us to, to and lead us to lean on saying yes to more things than to say no. Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin is that um, I, we all know that that receiving a no sucks. Yeah. Right? So rejection sucks. Receiving a no sucks. It creates discomfort. It creates an uncomfortable situation socially. If you say, hey, so I have a great idea. Do you want to hear it? And I say, no. Now we have an awkward moment. Right. right? Like, okay. Well, I guess uh, well, we're done. How yeah. will you? So I'm afraid of how you will react. Right. You might get angry. You might get upset. You might get encouraged to push me harder. Now I have to push back harder. It's all uncomfortable. Um, I don't want to hurt your feelings. For many, many reasons, it's going to create, it's going to put me in a more challenging situation than if I just say yes. Yes is easy. Yes mm -hmm. is safe. You're going to be happy if I say yes. I'm going to make you happy. I don't know if I'm making a mistake, but it's easy to say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it requires less decision making on my part, less choices. And because of all these emotional and mental uh, reasons, we tend to say yes way too much mm -hmm. and we don't say no enough. Okay, so you said there's a number of things that you need to say no to. Let's kind of go through a number of those things that you need to say no to, whether yeah. you're a startup or a, a different organization. Yeah, so there's a lot. I think it starts um, starts with something as simple as, uh, can I quickly interrupt you? Which is one of those questions I hate because you already did. Yeah. Right? It's a question that's kind of irrelevant. Like yeah. you're asking for permission for something you've already right. done, right? So a, a better way of saying it would be, sorry that I'm interrupting you, but <laughs> I want to say something. Yeah. So uh, can I quickly interrupt you? Can I quickly share an idea with you? Um, this is a, a common scenario in a workplace where pe other people are around you working as well, where you are maybe it's a good time, right? But more often than not, it's actually not a great time for you to be interrupted. And again, because of social pressure, awkwardness, because there's a human standing in front of you and it's tough to send them away, we'll say, sure, independently if it's the worst time ever yeah. or really a good time. And these interruptions, they are very costly, right? Uh, I think we all underestimate the, the, the cost of, uh, of interrupting somebody once they're in the flow. Right? It's not just those five minutes where you share these ideas with me. It is the 35 minutes that it'll take right. me to get back into the groove. Um, and, and sometimes I'm not going to get back into my productivity flow and mood for the rest of the day or the week. Yeah. Right. So, so a few minutes of interruption at the wrong time can be really damaging. So let me inter can I quickly interrupt you is, a, is a, a good time to say no and practice saying no. And a funny thing, this is something I learned from engineers. A funny thing is, or from people that are very... Uh, protective of their productivity right. is that uh, once you go through this experience a few times with somebody that tells you no, <laughs> yes. you learn to ask yourself, is this really important enough for me to be rejected? Because if it's not, I don't want to go and get myself a rejection oh, yes. because I know what the person is yep. going to say. Um, you learn to be a little bit more uh, mindful of, do I need to say this now? Could I send this in an email? Right. Right. So you, you select the channels a bit, a bit better. And this is a good thing. You want by saying no to help others around you, to respect your productivity, to um, choose their channels of interruption carefully. And mm -hmm. with that, elevate you in your own productivity and the, the, the things you're able to do. So can I interrupt you is one really good example. It happens a lot. Um, meetings are another thing in the workplace, right? Yeah. Being sucked into meetings without any rhyme or reason, right. uh, having these meetings be very long, uh, you know, you know, uh, so when people send me an invite to a meeting, typically I'll just reject it. I'll just know it and then go no. And then if it's really important for me to be there, they'll send me an email. They'll try to convince me. Then the next thing that I'll do is why is this 60 minutes? Yes. Why not 30? Why not 15? Like, why do we need to spend so much time on this? Right. So saying no in how people use up your time. Right. Right. Um, meetings is a good example. But then there's so many things for startups more in generic, not in the, at the workplace where it's like, Business opportunities. Right. I love that. Yes. Partnerships. Yes. Let your startup has zero users. 
our startup has zero users and customers. Let's sit down and think about a partnership to combine our lack of traction because magically it's probably going to be great because in 10 years you've told me your vision is to own the world and in 15 years we're going to be the biggest thing ever. So we should partner up right now when it's still time, right? Sure. So there's all these meetings of a meetings of a meetings, business partnerships, proposals for business partnerships that when you actually challenge the question, why does this company want to sit down with us? There's no really good reason. Uh, there's no really good time. They're not really mindful of this. And if you you know challenge it, you'll find out it's not a good use of our time to right. go and meet with this other company right now and try to come up with some kind of a partnership. Partnerships. And then experts, right? Um, yeah. People that seem important. Right. Maybe they even are important in some context. I'm sure everybody's important to somebody. But, uh, but that are not, the, that can help you right now with your number one priority. Right. So some investor like I get uh, we're not raising money right now. We're profitable. We're growing really fast. We're happy where we are. Every day, there's some really fancy investor with a really. Oh, you get those too? Yeah, of yeah. Course, of course, right? <laughs> with rain, uh, name recognition yes. that wants to have coffee. Right. right. So I love coffee, but I can't only have so much coffee in a day. Right. Even as a Greek person. So I have to say no to these things because they, they have no purpose right now. Uh, and so it doesn't matter how many millions you have or how many billions you manage or how you know, how uh, well-known you are. So if I take a selfie with you, somebody will think I'm cool and important. Are you helping me help my customers today? No, then we cannot meet today, right? There's no purpose to this. So investors, advisors, um, consultants, all kinds of people that have the appearance of importance. Right. So, it's, so you think maybe this person can help us. Maybe this person can give us money someday. Um, but that, that can't help you with what your top priorities today you should just say no. And I could go on at events, meetups, right. networking, all kinds of things, uh, um, you know, suggestions from uh, even users or customers on what to build around your product. Right. There's many, many things where you have to say no, and it takes discipline, it takes energy. But if you, if you know what's truly important, like knowing what's not important is equally uh, empowering as being very aware of what is important, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, those are some just on top of my head, some of the things that happen every single day where I see startups, they waste 80% of their time with the things that are not the most important thing they could be doing. Um, and if they learn to say no, it would make a dramatic difference in their odds to succeed and execute. I have a lot of people uh, in the audience who are very nice and they're probably thinking, well, you know, Steli and Pornima, it's, it's easy for you guys to say no, but I, I, I could never do it. Like, I just, I don't want to be impolite or I don't want to be rude or yeah, I don't want to miss one of those opportunities. So maybe we can coach some of the audience out there on how to go about saying no. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, so I think there's a number of things that there's three simple principles to learning to say no. One is, just like with everything in life, if you want to get good at something, you have to do it often. Yes. Right? So get used to saying no a lot. Uh, the next thing is you want to do it politely, right? There's no, there's no need to be an asshole about things. And the way you deliver the no matters. Sure. I'm not saying that doesn't matter. So if you do it in person, doing it with a smile, doing it in somewhat of a you know, um, sensitive tone, and maybe adding a sentence that explains the no, right? right. Uh, I have one of my co-founders taught me a lot about, actually both my co-founders taught me a lot about saying no. They're both engineers. And, uh, and, but they didn't necessarily try to be polite or explain why. Sure. They just said no and turned around and kept working, right? So, um, so uh, you know, adding a sentence or two and saying, I'd love to give you time right now is very bad for me. Can we do this later? Can you shoot me a quick email about this? Is this urgent or is it important? Right. right? If it's important, we can talk about it later. Yeah. If it's urgent, yes, let's talk about it now if the house is on fire. Yeah. Um, so you want to do it politely. Uh, you want to get into the habit of doing it often, especially if you're somebody that's like, oh, my God, I don't know how to say no. And then the only way that you're going to learn how to say no is by doing it often, not once every two years. You have to get into the habit of it. Um, and then the third thing is you have to do it decisively. So because we don't like saying no, right. we like to say no in the most yes way possible, right? So we won't say, I don't have time right now. We'll say, is that, could we do this maybe in five minutes? But five minutes is a bad time as well, right? Or, um, well, we want to meet up with you guys for a business partnership. We would we'll love to meet up with you guys. Um, today's bad. Could you reconnect with us next week to find the time? Next week is also bad. 
right? But because you don't want to just say no, you you want to leave the door open right. for a yes. But all you're doing is you're wasting there in your own time. You sure. just you're just making it worse, right? Because if you do it politely, I find that people respect honesty and the people that don't they're not the people you want around they're not going to help you they need to figure some other issues out before before they should be in your life and 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 working with your business so uh leaving the the hope alive that this no will turn into a yes it's a bad idea unless you really want to say yes right you and you know you're going to say yes next week um so these are the three things say it often say it nicely and politely but say it decisively and the, the third thing is probably one of the hardest things because you're not sure. Right. You're saying no to this, you know, investor, but what if you're going to need money in the future? <laughs> You've read some article, never say no to investors, always take their money. Maybe other people are smarter than you. Maybe you're committing a, a, a company killing mistake. So because you have some self-doubt about your own decisions, you don't say no decisively. Um, you need to get comfortable with saying no and making a mistake. So, so if it turns out that I tell you, no, I can't do this uh, for you, I can't meet with you, and this is this turns out in the long scheme of things that was, it was a bad decision, then I'll have to live with it. And th- what you want to optimize for is not never making a bad decision. It's making decisions really fast and learning once you uncover that you made some bad decisions. Right. But we're all going to make some bad decisions. We, we're not perfect. And getting comfortable with that with that ambiguity of I'm saying no to this, although I'm not sure if this is a mistake or not, um, learning to get comfortable with that discomfort is, is it sucks. Yeah. Nobody loves that, but you train, you know, you put the training wheels on and you do it every single day and eventually you get more comfortable with it and better at it. All right. So practice saying no often. Now, there are times, you, you mentioned the thing about customers, yeah. right? And so there are times where customers might want to sneak something into your roadmap or even an employee might come back and say, oh, you know, I talked to five customers and I know we've got like feature X, Y, Z, but I really want to satisfy this, this other customer out there and we want to get them to renew. So let's, let's, let's shove this into the, the product roadmap. Yeah, that's a really bad idea. Yeah. Right? So uh, in general, I think it's hard to say no to uh, the people closest to the money, right? Uh, and the people that... Can, uh, matter the most which is your which are your customers Salespeople in particular are uh, exceptionally bad at this this is a a a reason why there's a lot of friction usually between sales and engineering teams is because sales over promises right and they don't over promise because uh you know they like over promising they over promise because they feel the pressure that if i don't say yes we're thinking of building this i'm going to lose the deal Mm -hmm. right and they want the deal so much that it's hard for them to say no so they always kind of give the impression, even if they don't say outright, we're going to build this for you, they give the impression that we are probably are going to build this for you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two things where you need to learn to say no to customers. One thing is you need to learn to say no to the wrong customers. Mm -hmm. This is a very kind of a a crucial thing. And I just yesterday, funny enough, I had another founder tell me the story of the Southwest Airlines uh, CEO. It was this this story of like this, this lady that was flying with them hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles or tens of thousands of miles or something crazy. And uh, one day she said, like after years and years of flying the airline, she sent him a, an email and was like basically complaining that she spent so much money with the airline. She's flown so much with it. And there's no perk for her, no miles, no lounges, no we appreciate your business, yeah. no stickers, nothing for her. And that, that Southwest Airlines sucks and they need to like get their game together. Otherwise, they're going to lose her as a customer. Right. And his reply apparently famously was, we will miss you. <laughs> right? And, and I don't know if he wanted to come across as a dick or not, right? Or if it was the well, eventual. It, it is their, their brand but it is, is their that. Brand, yeah, right? they're he, all brands. Basically, the, 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 the main message here was that he was like, well, we like your business, but what you want us to be is not who we are. Right. So if you want that, you're not our customer. We're not your airline. You should go to somebody that really like yeah. does a great job at that. I think that comes with knowing what customer you can serve really well and what is authentic to your brand and your business. And knowing that means knowing who's not a good fit to you, right. to your business. And a lot of times companies, they just think if there's a, a, a customer that has money and willingness to pay us, we should try to get that money any way possible. 
that is a really bad idea, right? It causes all kinds of issues. It causes people to be, your customers to be unhappy. It causes them to churn. It causes them to tell everybody else how much you suck. Right. It causes them to be uh, asking your support team every day a hundred times for a thousand different things. They they will just create a lot of cost that is hidden and that will that will uh, make this a very you know a bad um, investment in your business. Uh, it, it sucks for morale to see customers go and see them complain and hating everything you do. So it's just bad all, all, all around. So it's important for businesses to know what is our, who is our customer and who isn't. Right. And to learn to say no to customers that are not a good fit to your business. And this is something that most companies fail at. So for us, the first thing we do at Closer with every kind of lead that comes our way is we qualify them. Mm -hmm. And qualifying them, it means just two simple things. First, we try to figure out, can we truly help you? Is our product the best product for you in the market? Or is there something better out there for you? And then can you help us, right? Yeah. How, good, how good will you be as a customer? How big of a customer can this be? What, how close will this relationship be? Only if the answer is yes to both these questions, we even try to sell you anything yeah. right? and close the deal. So learning to say no to customers that are not ideal to you, a lot of times startups, they get sidetracked with to enterprise businesses. Right. They're like, we're going to be a small professional uh, customer business, SMB is going to be our market. And then there's a big company that sends them an email and says, we're interested in your product. And boom, the startup will lose all their focus and right. go, well, we didn't want to be an enterprise uh, business, but Google wants to pay us lots of money. <laughs> and, right? so it's nobody a, says no to nobody them. Nobody says no yeah. to them. It's such a sexy thing. It's so hard to say sure. no. I did exactly this in the first startup that yeah. I failed. It was like an end consumer product and Google sent us an email yeah. that they wanted to buy it. Uh, and we we're like, well, if Google wants to buy it. Maybe we should be in enterprise sales. Right? It turned out to be a really bad idea. So... Um, you need to say no to the wrong customers. And then you need to learn to say no to um, customer requests if they're not part of your roadmap. Mm -hmm. So there's two things. You always want to listen to to what your customers have to say. Right. You need you want to not just listen to listen, listen to learn. And, you know, you want to find out not just what they're proposing as a solution, as a feature they want to sneak in, but why. Because customers usually, they are the best in the world at describing their pain. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're not great at describing or prescribing a solution to it. Otherwise, they would be product managers and building products, right? So you want to maybe not pay as much attention to the feature they want, mm -hmm. but the problem they have. But um, what we have done at Close.io, and I do this with, with lots of things, it's kind of a little hack to learn when to say no or not, to stay disciplined on it, is that instead of just having a product roadmap of here's everything we want to build, is we have an anti-roadmap. I love that, yeah. Right? So we, we wrote down what are all the things we're never going to do. And we revisit that. Yeah. Right? We're, sure. we're aware enough that never we might be never. wrong. Yeah. So once a year, we'll sit down and we'll go, is this still true? Why is it still true? We'll challenge ourselves on this. But we need to have clarity on what we, what we never want the product to become. And then when a customer asks for something that is on that anti-roadmap, and if there's no other solution to solve that issue, we will just tell them. And you need to learn to tell them, you know what? I understand why you want this. Here's why we will not build this most likely. And I want to be transparent. If that's a deal breaker, I want to help you transition to a better solution. Right. If not, then I'm happy, right? We want to keep you, but you, I want to create the right expectations. So you need to say no when they want something you know you're not going to build. And it's tough. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that I, those two things: say no to the wrong customers and say no to customer feature requests that you know you're not going to build. So I love the anti roadmap. Now, for those people out there who maybe are individual contributors and they are still getting stuff that's on the roadmap, but it just seems like they can't get it all done. Do you have any solutions for them? Yeah. So one thing that I like to um, to use myself is, you know, we all, I think we're pretty familiar with using to-do lists, right? Yeah. And we all have either in our mind or on a piece of paper on some tracking tool, we have a way of like writing down all the things we want to do. Um, something I like to use is the not to-do list. And so I will have a list every day of things I'm not going to work on today, not going to tackle. And this is a, just a simple hack. It's just a psychological thing yeah. for me to take a moment at the beginning of my day to know what I'm going to say no to. Even if I'm tempted or even if I don't pay attention for a moment and somebody kind of tricks me into some, something. Um, and that just having that not to do list helps me when I get sidetracked to go, wait a second. I said today I'm not going to work. I'm not going to get distracted by these type of things yeah. because I need to finish this other project. Right. So it just helps me um, stay focused, and I, I try to maintain the not-to-do list 
is even more important to me uh, a lot of the times than the to-do list itself. Very nice. I, I have my not to do, but usually it becomes somebody else's to do. <laughs> I yeah. delegate it away. Yeah. So yeah. very nice. So, you know, we've talked about what to say no to. Do you ever say yes? Never. Never. Right. Never. Yeah. I would never say yes. Okay. Right. So Yeah, I had course. to like wrestle you to, to come to, onto the show, right? Of course, yeah. right? Of course. I say, see, I do say no to a bunch of interview mm -hmm. requests, right? So I don't say a yes to everybody, yeah. but to somebody Thank you. like you, yeah. of course. Um, Yes. So uh, to me, you want to simplify the things you say yes to. Um, and you want to simplify it to the things that are truly important in life. And sometimes, you know, I important in your life might be something different to somebody else. But in business, right. in that context, anything that helps you get more successful customers, and the important thing is successful, and yeah. right? not just more customers, Everything that helps you get more successful customers and everything that helps you make your customers more successful are things to say yes to usually. And of course, you want to weigh these things because there's 100 things we could do right. for the product or in the marketing and selling and in a variety of departments in the, in the business to get more successful customers, to get our customers more successful. So you want to weigh what is the thing that will have the biggest impact? What is the thing we can execute on the fastest? You, there's still ways to order the list of things, but typically things that help us make our customers successful and more successful and get us more successful customers are the things you want to say yes to. So one of the things that um, helped us a lot in terms of being focused and know, knowing what to say yes to was something I learned from uh, Paul Graham, PG from Y Combinator. The first week when we went through YC, we had a conversation with him and his whole focus was to try to figure out that one metric that would be the biggest signal to success, mm -hmm. right? So we would give him a number and he would challenge us. Is that really the number? We would go back and forth, similar to Facebook's number being active users mm -hmm. versus MySpace number being uh, new signed up users, yeah. right? You take a better, a better number for success. For us back then, um, for the software that we were doing at the time, it was fully subscribe paying users. Okay. So he said, well, if that's the number, then the core KPI we wanna track, can you promise me to grow that number 10% at least every single week during YC, during the next three months? Mm -hmm. We said, yes. So we shook hands on that. And as he was trying to let go of my hand, I was like, do you have your credit card with you? Yeah, nice. Right? And he was like, that's exactly why I want you guys. Yes. And then after I signed uh, him up, I uh, went through the entire room of startups that were waiting to have an office hour with him and I tried to sign up as many people as possible. Awesome. And, you know, in the early days, it's easy because you have 10 yeah. customers, right? And then you have to just get one oh, more the next yeah. week and you have 10%. But it's also difficult because you're nobody and the company doesn't exist and nobody knows about you and the product is buggy and all that. Every week it gets progressively harder. But one beautiful thing of that, that um, tactic is that every week before we committed to the project of the next week, right. we sat down and we we're like, what is going to bring us 10%? Yep. What's going to bring us 27 new paying customers next week? Yeah. And then when you have a, a request for a business meeting with some ginormous company, you're like, well, that's not going to get us 10 more users right. or 10 more customers next week. So we're saying no to this. Uh, so in, in, similar to the product, we looked at all the things we wanted to build and we're like, which one of these features will bring us you know, subscribers and paying customers. So it was a nice hack in the early days to stay laser focused mm -hmm. and know what to say yes to. And it was the thing that would get us to that goal next week right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steli, for joining us today on Film Engineer TV. Any last words for our audience? Yes. Yeah, so for anybody who wants to practice uh, getting rejected or rejecting, you can send me an email, steli at close.io. Uh, and pitch me the, your product, your software. If you want to work, pitch yourself, uh, work for us, for Close Eye, pitch yourself, and I will reject you. Just, just not because of you, it's nothing personal, just to get you into the habit of like working with rejection and maybe following up with me one more time. Or maybe if you don't want to do that, just see if I can uh, live up to what I, what I yes, promised. Yes, see if Steli will say no. Send me an email and say, Steli, I could be a customer, I could buy your book, I could be a listener of your podcast or whatever. And then give me your best pitch, Steli, and I'll pitch you and you reject me. Um, besides that, uh, you know, if you, if you like um, listening to, if, if some of the things that I said today were valuable, I have a little podcast with a good friend of it's ours. It's a great yep, Heaton podcast. Heaton Shah. Um, you can go to thestartupchat.com. Um, it's 20, uh, two episodes a week, each 20 minutes. It's very short. Uh, two founder CEOs, very different perspectives, very different personalities, and we tackle 
tactical things like how to say no, yep. um, but also out there things like how the death of our parents affected us as entrepreneurs right. and religion and startups, all kinds of funky topics. So if you like podcasts, maybe you want to check that out. Yeah, I highly recommend it. I know I'm a subscriber. Awesome. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. And special thanks to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for their help in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please be sure to share it with your friends, your teammates, and your boss so that everyone will practice saying no. And subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode. I'll catch you next time. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster.